Hello, this is the fifth lesson of our composition workshop. In this video, we are going to analyze Witold Litoslavsky's Zahar variation composed in 1975. This is a piece for solo cello. Let's listen to it and then we will talk about it. Before we dive into analysis, I'd like to make a couple of explanations. First of all, two things should be clear. You see some indications with letter here, the points, and always with fortissimo dynamic and other one here. But it continues and always the letters are given. You know what the letters mean. This is S, the first letter of Zacher, and A, C, with corresponding pictures. H means be natural in German, etc. I'm going to explain it again. This is one uh, aspect of the piece. Those sections are very clear, and the other aspect is here with uh, pianissimo, piano, mezzo piano, etc., with changing in changing dynamics, and you see microtones. The symbols for microtones are not standardized. Today, more or less, they are standardized, but in the uh, earlier times, they were not standardized. And Lutoslavsky used this is our regular flat. And this is quarter tone flat, a quarter tone lower. And 
if he combines both, that means it is three quarter note lower. And you see it here. This is three quarter low, uh, three quarter note, and this is one quarter note lower. And the same logic um, in raising. This is our regular sharp, and this is one quarter tone higher. Those are the only sharps he used. He didn't use three quarter note higher. So, one quarter note higher, one quarter note lower, and this is three quarter note lower. And we are going to talk about these um, sections with the tones of Sahar hexachord only. I assume the uh, sections between them are freely composed and they don't have any structure. And this is another example of this balance between structure and uh, musical decisions. We are going to see he follows a very uh, strict structure here, but he also puts some free composed sections between the strict structured passages. Let's start with the analysis. The piece is written with the so-called Zahar hexachord. I explained it already in the first lesson. S means E flat in German, A and C, and then H means B natural, E means E, and R with an added E at the end means D. So the piece based on this hexachord. How he constructs a structure by using Sahar hexachord is highly interesting, very simple, but highly interesting and effective, in my opinion. He takes the Zahar hexachord and then he divides the structure into two parts. On the one side, we have the tones of the Zahar hexachord. On the other side, we have the other tones, the other tones of the chromatic scale. And uh, we are going to call the first one thread one and the second one thread two. There are two simultaneous processes in the piece. We are going to examine it. If we look at the beginning, the first systems of the piece, then we will notice the letters, the pitches of the Zahar hexachord, and then the indications with the letters. Then, as I explained, this is a very strict structure in the piece, and then between them we have some freely composed uh, passages as contrast. They sound like improvisation. We are going to concentrate us on, the, on this strict structure on this strict process. Another thing uh, we notice is the number of the notes in each uh, section increases. First, we hear only one note, then a free composed passage, and then we hear two notes, and then a free composed passage, and then we hear four notes, then free composed passage, etc. And another thing we notice is that the number of the notes in every phrase increases. In the first phrase, we have one note. In the second phrase, we have two notes. In the third phrase, we have four notes, etc. This is the entire piece, and we see the phrases or the appearances of Sahar hexachord. We have one note, two notes, four notes, seven notes and it increases. Those are not random numbers. He didn't say, okay, let's take two notes, four notes, seven notes, just like that. He used a very well organized system to determine the number of the notes in each phrase. Rotation number of the phrase means the order, the order of the phrase. This is the first one. This is the second, this is the third, fourth, fifth, etc. This is the rotation number. 
And numerical uh, quantity of the phrase means the number of the nodes in each phrase. This is one node, the second phrase has two nodes, the third phrase has four nodes, the fifth phrase has seven nodes, and etc. This is the formula how Lutoslavsky determines the numerical quantity of each phrase. Numerical quantity of the first phrase is 1, and rotation number of the first phrase is 1, and he adds the numbers together and that makes 2. 1 plus 1 makes 2. And this is the numerical quantity of the next phrase. The same formula. Numerical quantity, the number of nodes in the phrase. There are two numbers in the second phrase, and this is the second phrase. 2 plus 2 makes 4. And this is the numerical quantity of the next phrase. And he continues with the same formula. 4 plus 3 makes 7. And this is the numerical quantity of the fourth phrase. 7 plus 4 makes 11. And this is the numerical quantity of the fifth phrase, etc. Like Fibonacci numbers, this gives another kind of increase. A unique kind of increase. It is a very clever and very effective system, in my opinion. We can see that in the score 1, 2, 4, 7, 11. And the piece continues. This is only the first page. Another thing we notice is the rhythmic structure. An 8 note, 2 8 notes, 2 8 notes. 1 16th and then at the end a 16th. Actually, it doesn't matter. It gives only the, uh, the end of the phrase. It could be longer, shorter, but this is focus on the short values. They seem like the added values by Messian, but there is uh, another structure we are going to see. And here to 8, 1 16th. 2, 8, 1, 16, and here 2, 8, 1, 16, 2, 8, 1, 16, and 3, 8, and 1, 16 knots. This is the entire structure. It begins with an 8, then 2, 8, and then 2, 8 knots, and 1, 16. This is the structure he used. There is not a formula, or I couldn't find anyone, I don't know, maybe there is one. But what I found is a balance between a structure and musical decision. He increases the values, this is clear, this is also optically visible. And this increase, 2 plus 1, 2 plus 1, 2 plus 1, and 2 plus 1, 3 plus 1. Here he begins to increase the value and here we see 3 plus 1, 4 plus 1. And here the repetition of that uh, at the end, but here at the beginning he adds 2 times 2 plus 1, 2 plus 1. And here 3 plus 1, 4 plus 1 and 6 plus 1. This is an interesting point. 2 3, 4, but not 5. Instead of this, he used 6. And here, once again, 3, 4, 6, and 8, not 7 or something like that. The reason is, in my opinion, the difference between 2 and 3 is recognizable or between 3 and 4 is recognizable. But imagine... Could you uh, recognize, could you identify the difference between 16th, 16th and 17th, 16th? Very difficult, very difficult. If the number goes higher, uh, I don't think that someone would uh, recognize the difference between 192, 16th and 193.16. It is not possible. So, I think this is the reason he 
tries to make it recognizable, to keep it recognizable. Instead of five, that's why he used six, because the difference between four and six is more recognizable. Here we would expect maybe even more difference, but he didn't, probably for him it was enough. This is like the difference with three, four, he takes the, uh, the twice, the twice values, six and eight. And at the end, like a, a codetta, an addition, tam, pa, pam, pa, pam, pa, three times uh, repeated pattern. And this is rhythmical structure. There is also another process. Maybe you noticed it while listening. It begins in the lowest register of the violoncello. Those are the lowest pitches that violoncello could play. There's no lower E flat, there's no lower A, there's no lower B. C is the, the, the lowest string anyway. In the course of the piece, there's a process from this register to this register. And this is the uh, highest register, actually. Okay, cello could go maybe higher, but the sound would lose its character. This process is also not made randomly. Also here, he uses a very simple and effective structure, a principle or a system, whatever you call it. He begins in the lowest register of the violoncello here. And then, what is the lowest tone? This is C here. This is the lowest pitch in the first appearance of the Zachar hexachord, the entire Zachar hexachord. He transposes it one octave up in the next repetition. If we ignore this one, what is then the lowest pitch in this appearance? It is this D. It is transposed in the next appearance, in the next repetition, one octave higher. If we ignore this one, what is the lowest pitch? It is this one, E flat. And it is transposed one octave up in the next appearance. The process continues until the violoncello reaches its highest register. Remember the first lesson, I took the Zahar hexachord and I repeated it over and over again in different octave registers. And this is actually the same. He repeats the Zahar hexachord 18 times. As I always say, and this is a perfect example of this. If you use a simple pitch material, in other words, if your piece is simple on one side, you have to balance it by constructing the other side or the other sides more complex. And Lutonslavski does exactly that. He uses a very simple pitch material only one hexachord and without changing the order he repeats it but he supports or he balances this simple pitch material with complex processes he applies complex processes on this simple pitch material at the summary is we have two threads we only analyzed the first thread thread one with Zahar hexachord but the structure is important. Let's mention the characteristics, the features of both threads. Pitch material of thread 1 is the Zahar hexachord. And the pitch material of thread 2 is the other six pitches except those of the Zahar hexachord in the chromatic scale. This is a contrast. The contrast between threads in terms of pitch material is very large. So the direction, the thread 1 goes from lower to higher. If you look at the score, thread 2 
consists of three decomposed parts. It begins in a higher register and then it goes down. But it is not uh, gradual, it is not systematical. But the tendons, the tendons of the thread 2 is beginning in a higher register and going to a lower register, for example, here in F clef and it goes down here, lower and it goes lower almost in the lowest register of the violoncello and here we see D flat almost the lowest pitch. Thread 1 goes from lower to higher and thread 2 goes from higher to lower. Number of notes in phrases, thread 1 is very methodical, but thread 2 is, as I said, freely composed. Arrangement of the notes, thread 1 organized and thread to, there is no organization principle generally, it is freely composed. Tuning, 12 tone equal temperament, and thread 2 is microtonal. Dynamic is fortissimo throughout the piece, and thread 2, in thread 2, we have every dynamic level between pianissimo and forte. As you see, it is about balance. To conclude the lecture, I'd like to play the piece once again. Let's listen to it. Thank you. 
And the last system is an addition. The piece, the structure, the process ended here, actually. And then this is once again a freely composed part. And this is codetta or more, uh, maybe uh, not coda, codetta. Codetta is more suitable, I guess. That's all for this lesson. Thank you for watching and I'll see you in the next video.